But you see, passing over the love of God is at the core of sin. It was in the Garden of Eden that this man and this woman had every good thing to eat and they passed over every bit of it to go to the one thing that was not meant for them to go to. It was when the builders... You're doing that so I can't scream, aren't you? It was when the builders passed over or rejected the living stone that they stumbled and fell. You see, the grace or gift of God that was Jesus. And they rejected Him so that their withering old bodies could enjoy a season of pleasure. Thinking they had the upper hand. Because of this sin, mankind will die the first death. And then, in a time which just seems like no time has passed at all, a book will be opened. And unless that person's name is written in that book, they will be thrown into the lake of fire and that will be the second death. Why? Because they passed over the love of God. Now the saddest thing to me about all of the people who pass over the love of God is that that which may be known about God has been made manifest to them. God has showed it to them. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's been there, publicly displayed. You know that passage from Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. They saw and recognized God's creation. They knew but did not glorify God. They knowingly received the good things from God, but they were not thankful. They became self-made men, legends in their own mind. They were puffed up with knowledge instead of built up with love. Their base of reason became their mind so that their heart was darkened by God. They became fools. They passed over the love of God. Have you ever passed over the love of God? Our text tonight, Luke 11, verse 42 says, But woe unto you Pharisees! You tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over the judgment and love of God. These ought ye to have done and not have the other undone. Now there's a parallel passage to this in Matthew chapter 23. I'll read it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These things ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. There are two things passed over in this text. The judgment, or some translations say justice of God, and the other is the love of God. Matthew's account, we can associate the weightier elements of the law, judgment, and mercy, and faith, with the judgment or justice and the love of God of Luke. Now, the judgment of God, I mean, this is like absolute final authority, folks. Whatever God says is the way it is. Amen. It's not any of this God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's just God says it, that settles it. Amen. I mean, it's like... One person not believing in God does not make him any less God. Amen. And you know, we participate in that. But I'm going to tell you, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to participate in the love of God also. The Lord desires us not just so that we can be filled with His love, but so that we also might love. Amen. Pharisees were in a position of religious authority. Authority without the proper or humble position of the heart is an extremely volatile one. Take a look at the life of Saul. I'm talking of Kish. Started out very humble, very pious, very obedient, but he went out just the opposite way. What happened? Passed over the love of God in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
got on the wrong track. These words of Jesus were not spoken like for instruction to these Pharisees. I mean, he was not giving them some kind of little lesson here that they could go home and learn something off of it. These are, this is a judgment of the hearts of these individuals. But I want you to know that Jesus did not come, he said so, he did not come to judge, but he did make judgments, and when he made judgments, those judgments were true. And so when he judges these people's hearts, it's right. We need to accept that. It's very easy to sit in the seat of judgment and point back at the Pharisees who are 2,000 years dead. But I'm going to tell you that pointing out the evil in someone else does not make anyone else more righteous. It does not help. Every believer must be careful in his or hers finger pointing and accusations to make sure that their fingers are cocked and primed for restoration and not destruction. We have to be careful how we speak. While we have the spirit of Christ, we are not Christ. I do not know what's going on in the heart of another individual. And while there are certain things that I can say God condemns that, when I approach them, I need to approach them in a way in which they might be restored. So I don't want you to walk out of here tonight thinking that you've got some license to go out there and assassinate people. Because gee, that's not why we're here. This is We're speaking of the love of God. We're just, I'm just telling you what happens when you pass over it. <clears throat> Today, men forsake weightier things, just as the Pharisees did, for lesser things than tithing herbs. Did you realize that? For lesser things than tithing herbs. Now, men, you need to go into the kitchen sometime and examine some of these little seeds. And you think about tithing those things, and you say, oh, man, that is nothing. There are less things than that. Our generation will drive to a church on Sunday or some other day, seeing all manners of people on the way, but know that if they were to stop and to develop a relationship with them, uh, they would probably end up having to pick them up, and the Baptist would beat them to the restaurant after church. Sometimes people will uh, take pleasures in this world which cause them to pass over the love of God. I, I have pet peeves. And I was born and raised in a place called, catch this phrase, Lake of the Ozarks. Say it again, Lake of the Ozarks. I love to fish. I love to swim. I love all of those kind of things. But I have watched in my life, person after person, buy a boat. And you know what they have to do with that boat besides pay the mortgage and the insurance and watch it rot in the yard? <laughs> they have to take it to the lake. Now they work five, maybe six days a week, so they only have one day left to take it to the lake. So they take it to the lake. Do we not understand that, that forsaking the assembly of the saints... That forsaking your time around the table of the Lord for something as, as minimal as floating your boat is passing over the love of God and it is a lesser thing than the Pharisees tithing. At least they had a commandment to tithe. Hmm. That boggles my mind. I'm not going to go on anymore, my... I have other ones. I'm just going to forget them. I think you get the point. I am reminded from the scripture to be not slothful, but be followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises. Amen. Well, you let me tell you what their example was. Their example was not of one who passed over the love of God. Their example was not of one who majored in the minors. Their example was following their God wherever he would send them, in whatever conditions, to whomever he would send them. Amen. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever passed over the love of God? What is 
the love of God? I don't know if we've really defined that or not uh, by sermon title, but what is the love of God? Many people have developed a personal perception of what the love of God is, and they tend to follow their own view of things and say, I'm loving God. This is the love of God. Well, this is like the bottom line. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Bottom line, love of God. We receive it, we give it. It's all right there. That text, 1 John 3.16. Failing to lay down your life for a brother is to pass over the love of God. And you know, most of our laying our life down for our brother does not mean a, per, a permanent sacrifice. Normally it's just a temporary inconvenience. Jesus knew the heart of man and could rightly judge these men. Passing over the love of God can be done by anyone. You or me. I have two questions for you to ponder tonight. First question. How does one pass over the love of God? Now I've given you some thoughts here, but they're pretty subjective on my part. How does one pass over the love of God? I started thinking about this question, and so I started reading the text. And then I started reading past the text. And then I started reading before the text. And you know, I found out that I could go either way as far as I wanted, and I would find this same thing. When people sinned, they passed over the love of God. All of Jesus' teachings, no matter the words that he used, you can bring back to this text. Call the sin whatever it was, they were passing over the love of God. Two things bother me in how does one pass over the love of God. One is I see the world as passing over the love of God. He was publicly displayed. I also see the church passing over the love of God. Right now that one bothers me worse than the first. Because these are people who have already been redeemed. They've already tasted the heavenly gift. This is a very critical issue in the scripture. There are those who don't believe it. But there will come a time when there is no longer any sacrifice for their sin. Amen. There's an urgency to this. Amen. The world passed it over. Continues to pass it over. But also in the church. Some sacrifice to the idol of um, man-made emphases. I like reading the book of Revelation regarding the churches especially the woes to them, because it's kind of like a parallel passage to this. Some teach their children to commit sexual immorality. Where? TV. Some have soiled their garments. Some are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Like Ephesus, though, I fear that they have simply lost their first love. I think that's kind of at the core of it, the very beginning. You lose your love, and all of this, all these other symptoms just come along. Yes, what happened to them? Well, they passed over the love of God. They just lost it. By the way, if you're ever looking for a church to go to and wonder just exactly uh, where to go to look for one, I see... Uh, Two good friends of mine. I haven't seen in a long time. And this sister asked me, do you know how many good churches in this town? And now I don't. But here's what I'm going to tell you to do, Harriet. Look at their church sign out front. It may not tell you if it's a really good church, but it'll tell you if it's a really bad church. It'll tell you the emphasis. It'll tell you if they're passing over the love of God or not. Passing over the love of God can be as simple as not obeying, not hearing, or not looking. To pass over the love of God has a variety of excuses associated with it. Not to see it. To find something not as important as something else, so I passed it over. To think that something will be available at a later time. To simply not want something. To despise something. To overlook something. To think that, oh, I'm not worthy of having it. Or to simply think, I can't grasp it. 
Now, if you missed any of those, I'll repeat them in a minute in another context. But its meaning in this text seems to be to come near or alongside of it, to get really close to it, to have it right there before you, and then for some reason just to move right along like you're shopping. When Jesus spoke of passing over the love of God, he was not introducing a new thought. He was simplifying the error of false teachers and, in general, the disobedience of man towards God. Simple thought. You're passing over the love of God. I mean, this is the greatest thing you will ever experience. You're passing it over. How can you do that? When a person considers the teachings of Jesus from this perspective of passing over the love of God, that person gains heavenly insight into making his life count for eternity. These are the words of God. They're eternal. I mean, other things will pass away, but this won't. Take time to notice the teachings of Jesus. Passing over the love of God can be seen in many of Jesus' teachings, and I'm going to give you a few. I'm sure that most of you have heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I'm going to propose to you that one word is worth thousands of pictures. Amen. And that word is love. I'm not going to give you thousands, but I'm going to give you a few, and I would invite you to follow along with me, if you will, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. There was a woman. And this woman, by the way, I want to tell you, this, this like really happened. Some, maybe some notes in the bottom of your text that say this might not have, it really did happen. There really was a woman who was supposedly caught in the very act of adultery. Brought before Jesus, man emphasized the law which demanded the penalty of death. Jesus, the love of God, emphasized that going and sinning no more brought more satisfaction. Amen. This was a much better thing. But the men who were there at least, maybe women too, but the men wanted to satisfy their taste. And they were willing to pass over the love of God, forgetting the weighty, ele weightier elements of the law. They wanted punishment of the guilty. That They, for some reason, had some kind of a, a desire to see that. Have you known anybody like that? Who, who passed over the love of God by desiring to take pleasure in the punishment of others. It may not be an execution. It may simply be a nasty word said in a proper way. That gets that dig in there just where they need it. And you walk away there saying, boy, I really got them. Well, that's the same thing these men were doing with this woman. Have you ever passed over the love of God in that respect? In John chapter 9, uh, Jesus healed a blind man on the Sabbath. Men emphasized that healing on that day was not keeping the Sabbath. And Jesus taught that, you know, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in this person's life. <coughs> Concerning the Sabbath, Jesus also said, don't you know that the Sabbath was made for man and uh, not man for the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. And he, oh, oh, he added this, is it not lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Here the love of God was seeing the work of God displayed in this man's life. But since these men could not do what Jesus did, they noted that what was done uh, was done on the Sabbath. They also pointed out that, well, they were Sabbath keepers, you see. They were so self-centered that they could not rejoice with another because they didn't get the attention. And so they... Passed over the love of God. Amen. Have you ever passed over the love of God in that respect? In John chapter 10, Jesus taught about the Good Shepherd. And he revealed that leaders who manage people for the pay are nothing more than hireling sheep herders. When the wolf attacks, well, that man runs away because he doesn't care for the sheep. But Jesus, the good shepherd, does. And the good shepherd lays down his life 
for the sheep. Now the love of God here is in the laying down of one's life so that the other may be saved. The passing over the love of God is deserting your appointment at the sign of danger, not caring what happens to the sheep. I mean, it's kind of like saying this, listen, there's trouble in this church, I am out of here. As passing over the love of God. There is work to be done there. Now your work may not end immediately in exactly what you hope, but there is still work to be done there. Have you ever passed over the love of God in that way? In Luke 10, Jesus said to His disciples, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Do you know that um, upon their return, you know, they, they were talking about these things and Jesus said, uh, do not rejoice if the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now you say, what has that got to do with passing over the love of God? Well, there was a man by the name of Simon one time in Acts chapter 8 who in viewing the apostles saw that they were able to do things which were supernatural. And so he tried to buy the gift of God for his own pleasure. You see, the love of God is about valuing your heavenly citizenship, not into what special thing you may be able to do right here. And any time we are envious of what someone else can do, rather than rejoicing that our names are written in heaven, we're passing over the love of God there, friends. Because the love of God has provided for your citizenship in heaven. Have you ever passed over the love of God in that respect? Looking at another one? Or looking at something that you do on this earth and thinking that it's greater than something that you're going to have in heaven? Also in Luke 10, Jesus spoke of a particular Samaritan. And when you see that account, you find out what it means to be a neighbor and to help your neighbor. You know that passage. Jesus asked these, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers? Oh, I like this. And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Right, go and do likewise. You see, the priest and the Levite did observe the law by keeping themselves ceremonially clean when they passed by on the other side. They tithed their little mint here. I mean, they knew that whoever touches a dead body of anyone will be unclean for seven days or uh, varieties of laws in the Old Testament regarding that. From this, I can conclude that our Father would have each of us to go beyond where our human mind would reason in the area of love. You've got to get out of that brain. That's all I can say. The love of God compels us to take up the weightier elements of the law, even to the point of inconveniencing ourselves for another. Amen. This is what it takes to allow the love of God to be made manifest. This is what Jesus showed. When He, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but to be made Himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. I ask you, was that an inconvenience? I would think so. He has never asked us to give up that much. And yet that is the example that He gave us. That is the love of God. Amen. I'm ashamed sometimes at the things that I wouldn't give up in comparison to what Jesus has given up. Amen. You and I are in the place to be tested. I live in the state of North Carolina. And I'm going to make an honest assessment right now, and it may be the same in other states too. But it is a place of anger. 
is a place of anger over blacks and whites and Hispanics and Orientals and the North and the South. You live in a place with similar prejudices. Who do you help? How do you help? And to what extent do you help? You take this passage of passing over the love of God of the Samaritan here who was the neighbor and just take it and put it in your own home and look at your own neighbor and look at your, your own, the own person you work with. Is there anybody that you would pass by on the other side? To what extent would you go to help them? That's the question. Anything short of what the Samaritan did is passing over the love of God. Israel had many priests, many Levites. If one of them made himself unclean for a day or a week for the sake of doing what was right, there'd be someone else to take his place. You know, if, if the love of God compels me to get out of my routine for a day or even a week, There'll be someone else to take my place. This world is not going to quit turning. The government is not going to collapse because I'm not doing what I normally do each way. If you are doing what the love of God compels you to do at the moment, you are always doing the right thing. Amen. Have you ever passed over the love of God because loving another would inconvenience you? The love of, or Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and raised again. Amen. Finally, one more picture. Okay, remember I had all of these pictures for this one word. Here's another one. This is probably the one that causes the biggest lump in my throat. I will honestly say that I caused so much turmoil in a church one time over this passage that I never did hear the end of it. It's still going on. It's in Luke chapter 10. A godly woman. I mean a very personal, intimate friend of Jesus here. I want to see this sister someday. Martha was cumbered about much serving. And came to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve long? Bid her therefore that she might help. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I am not doing wrong by pointing out this error at that moment in Martha's life. I can tell you of another time when Martha came out to greet Jesus. I'm just pointing this out because any believer at any time can pass over the love of God. And when Jesus Christ was in their house, you can't imagine that. But try to imagine Jesus is in the house and you're going to go off and make jello or sweep the floor. And he's sitting there teaching. This is what we're looking at. Well, let me make it a little more relative to you. Because I have passed over the love of God like Martha did. And it's not easy for me to say. Well-meaning Sunday school superintendents and money counters and ushers and people making preparations for fellowship dinners have passed over the opportunity to listen to the words of Jesus because of this menial service. Yes. I'm a preacher. I love fried chicken. Got this, ladies? I can wait. Amen. After the church service, I'll even come down and help you cook it. That's right. <laughs> have you ever passed over the love of God in this manner? I did. More than once. I, um, I was raised in a place, in a church, where the Word of God was taught with fervency by Brother Roy Weiss. I'm going to tell you, I know I love that man. I love the Word of God because of his preaching. I mean, up until I was 12, 13 years old, I sat 
from as soon as I was able to leave my mother's lap, I sat on a second pew on the left side, right there on the inside. I knew that he was God's man. And I was fervent for that. I got a little older. I got a little rebellious. I got out of high school. I got into college. Why is it that when you get that age, and Eric, I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> he is that age. It's beside the point. You tend to get rebellious. Well, Brother Seth, I was 19 years old. And I was at a particular time in my life. I had many things going on. One of them was a hermeneutics class with you. And I'm serious in this. I, uh, he presented the Word of God. I don't care what subject he taught. It was the Word of God. And because of my preoccupation, I, like Martha, passed over the love of God in your class. And because of my rebelliousness, I wasn't happy about that. And I didn't get the grade I thought I deserved. And I had a point. And he wrote the syllabus. <laughs> my point was very small. <laughs> it was absolutely insignificant. And I am very sorry about that, brother. I paid $120 for that class. And I couldn't offer you enough money to get back what I lost. And neither do I have the time. But do not we treat our Lord in the same manner? Isn't it true that we look to God and say, God, I, I don't like what I've got from you. Well, you had the opportunity. But I have this point. And God says, I have a point too. I nailed my son to the cross. My point is nothing. I have a conclusion for you, and it's the other half of my sermon, and I have got to move through this. First question I ask you there to ponder was, how does one pass over the love of God? And that's what I tried to display there. I hope that I was able to convey that. Second one is, how does one not pass over the love of God? This is what I want to know. The other one condemns me. This one assures me of not being condemned if I'm obedient to it. Every day, each person has to make personal judgments in the form of choices. The love of God, every activity, every incident, every heartbeat, you have a chance to participate in the love of God. By seeing it, enter the kingdom of God, you'll see His love. Know its value Know that Jesus purchased men from God with His own blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. Otherwise, know how valuable that is, you see. Realize it's urgently. It's urgency. I mean, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. John Matthews, a brother of mine in the Lord, wrote a song and it inspires me and I have it. And it's called Man of God. And it says, Man of God, seize the day, redeem the time for Jesus, and give God the glory every day of your life. I love that song. Realize the urgency of the love of God. Want it. Want the love of God. Paul said, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of His resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings and become like Him in His death. And somehow, I mean, this is like beyond human reasoning, somehow be like Him in His resurrection. Somehow. Folks, I can't tell you how the resurrection, but I believe it. I love it. Love the love of God. Embrace it. Examine it. 
Really examine the love of God. Do you realize that if you were to meet an angel, I've heard of a lot of people who said they have, I believe that an angel might well ask you a question. What have you learned about the love of God? I'd like to have your insight. I would suggest you start learning more about the love of God right now just in case you meet an angel because you don't want to go away from there without having something to tell him. Amen. You've got to realize that, that God is just in giving you his love. Amen. He is just in doing that. No, you didn't deserve it. You're right if that's what you're thinking, but he's just in giving it. And then you've got to grasp it. Now, how do you grasp something that's intangible? Brothers and sisters, I don't believe it's that intangible. As a matter of fact, the back to Word of God tells me, Ephesians 3.18, that, uh, that it has a width and length and height and depth. I like that. Now, you may have to travel far and wide serving the Lord to find out how wide His love is. But when you get out there, as far as you can go, get a handle on it. Now, you may have to pray hard to know how high it is. But when you've really, really prayed, get a handle on that and know how high you are with Christ. And you might have to persevere for a really long time to know its length. But when you get out there so stretched out, get a handle on it. And you might have to serve in the lowest places that you can ever imagine. But when you get down there, you get a handle on it. And you hold it here, and you hold it here, and you hold it here, and you hold it here. Know the love of of God. Grasp it with all you have. The treasure of God is Jesus and He has displayed His treasure for the whole world to see. I mean, it is like a great pearl of great price. It is like a treasure in the field. When you see it, when you find it, whatever you have to do to get it, get it. Finally, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Because what I want to show you is that if you have passed over the love of God, and I know some of you have, I know all of you have, but if you're standing or sitting here tonight and you are guilty of having passed over the love of God and feel like that that's it for you, I mean, like you've done something that God can never forgive you of, I want to erase that from your mind. I want you to see. In Matthew chapter 26, one of the most touching passages of Scripture, we have the time when Jesus is taken. I mean, He is taken. And there is one by the name of Peter. Now, in verse 31, Jesus told him, This very night you will all fall away on the account of me, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've arisen, go ahead into Galilee. And Peter says, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Well, the night goes on. And we know that Jesus is taken. He's arrested. And then he is taken. Verse 57, turn there. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Now imagine, Peter's watching. No evidence. Sounds like a place I want to be. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow hmm, said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. High priest stood up, said to Jesus, 
Are you not going to answer? Jesus remains silent. We look down a little bit further. 65. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. They spit in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy, Christ, who hit you? Do you realize who's there watching this? Peter. Now Peter was sitting right out there in the courtyard. Servant girl, you're with Jesus. He goes through this rendition three times. Then you know what happens? The rooster crowed. Peter looked. It says in the other gospel account, and Jesus looked at Peter. They were still in eyesight. Peter knew. He had this opportunity to fulfill his confession and commitment to Christ. He chose at that moment to pass over the love of God and he rushed out of there. He went out and with all of the guilt that was upon him, he had denied his Lord, his Christ, his Savior. He had passed over the love of God. And not only did he knew it, he knew that Jesus knew it because Jesus had prophesied it and Jesus sustained it with that eye when he saw him and with the cock that crowed. Oh, but not all is lost because Jesus said, after you do this, Peter, return and strengthen your brothers. How in the world could Peter, the one who deserted Jesus, return and strengthen the brothers? By this. I have known the love of God because I sinned against Him and He forgave me. And he could look at his brothers and say, you have sinned against him too. You were there with me and you made the same confession. You sinned, but he will forgive you too. Maybe tonight, you come here tonight and you feel the weight of condemnation because you have passed over the love of God and you think, God can't forgive me. I'm going to tell you as just one of the many who has passed over the love of God in return that he has forgiven me and he will forgive you too. Thank you.